Alrighty, we are back. Your favorite podcast show of the week. This is Location Weekly. It's episode number 502, and we are recording live on February the 2nd. Uh, for you North American people out there, happy Groundhog Day. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know, Abriana, if you've seen the predictions, but the whatever the, uh, what's the groundhog in Pennsylvania? Um, it's Pucks at Puxatani Phil, is that who it is? Puxatani Phil, that's it. So apparently he predicted a uh, another six weeks of winter, um, but the other two, the one up here in Ontario and the other one have predicted an early spring. So uh, apparently two out of three says we're getting an early spring. I don't know. There, there's three groundhogs apparently they look at and yeah. So well, we'll I see. I don't even know how... I don't even know how the groundhog got out of his uh, little burrow this morning because uh, according to my in-laws who are in Pennsylvania, they just got crushed with like multiple mm -hmm. feet of snow. Um, my mother-in-law was sending me pictures. So it was very, very white and fluffy and deep. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, it, and for the first time ever, thanks to COVID, of course, it was a virtually uh, broadcast um, unveiling of the groundhog um, and its uh, prediction. So there you go. So, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, we are gearing up here for, um, you know, a big game coming up Sunday and I'm kind of excited about it. So I see that I've been a Bucks fan for a long time. Uh, you know, long before, long, long before the, uh, the Gruden days when they actually won a Super Bowl. you know, back to like the Tony Dungy and even prior days. So, uh, all my, my dad's side of the family is from Tampa and, I know my great aunt is like the biggest sports fan. And so she is super excited, uh, longtime Bucks fan, you know, so we're excited to be there. Um, you know, Brady may have had something to do with it, but you know, I'm yeah, more excited about this. Is Jerome also a Bucks <laughs> fan or is he uh, on another uh, team? You know, my husband's not, not a football fan actually. Like he'll watch it because of me, but he's definitely more interested in like baseball and jujitsu and, and some other things, but uh, yeah. It's definitely me, and I'm I'm trying to get my girls interested, and and they're not so much. But I'm happy for you. I'm I'm disappointed because I'm I'm a Saints fan, so I was I was a bit disappointed in the Brady Breeze showdown. Um, but uh, anyhow, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got I have a I have a lot of Saints fans friends. You know. Yeah. Too bad. You've <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I don't know. He may retire. I think. I think he's going to retire. We'll see. Um, who knows? Who knows? All right. Well, we have a good show for you this week. We have four stories we want to cover off. Um, no guests. No more special. Uh, you know, congratulations on 500 episodes or anything like that. Um, just for back to our, our regular four uh, stories, and I'll let Aubriana kick it off with a pretty interesting one. So. Yeah, so right here uh, in Atlanta, the heart of it, Coca-Cola um, has launched a new campaign with Walmart, actually, and we know Walmart has been testing out drones quite a bit, um, and they are continuing. So apparently Coca-Cola is, is launching a new like flavor brand, so they have Coca-Cola with coffee and Coca-Cola with coffee, zero sugar beverages that are soon to debut. Now, like, I actually just want to try this. This sounds super interesting to me. Um, I don't know, you know, it sounds, I don't know, maybe I'll like it. I, I'm not sure. I like coffee and sometimes I like Coke, but eh. anyways, back to the focus of the story, which is drone delivery. Um, so they're testing this out with select customers in, get this, Coffee County, Georgia, which is actually the middle of nowhere, it has about 35,000 in population. So I guess it's a good place to test out drone deliveries of Coca-Cola. Um, and they're working with the drone provider called Drone Up. Um, so this is kind of, you know, the newest in a series of drone delivery tests that Walmart has been doing. So they did in September, if you remember we talked about this. They had Quest Diagnostics and Drone Up, where they were doing these home delivery uh, COVID self collection kits. And then they did another pilot with um, a, a company called Flytrex to deliver select, you know, grocery and household essentials, um, you know, from Walmart stores. And they even had put on a holiday light show uh, with a thousand Intel drones and tested um, some carbon free delivery drone delivery with zip line technology. So they, you know, Walmart has been all in this trying to figure out what they can and can't do. Obviously, they're doing a lot of testing. I would love to know what their like 
big, you know, strategy and goals are, uh, but we're just getting, you know, little bits and pieces as they roll these out. So last week, the eligible consumers in Coffee County would have received their Coca-Cola. If you were there or you know anybody that did that, I would love to hear how that went. Let us know. Um, and then as of January 25th, consumers can also, if you are, you know, a big Coke fan and you want to try this newest flavor, you can use the Ibotta mobile rewards um, payment app at Walmart stores um, and get, I guess, some free, a free can of Coca-Cola with coffee. So there you go. This is super interesting. You know, I, I am very intrigued with the idea of food, drink, you know, goods, groceries, all of those things. Um, in addition to obviously essential things like medicine and testing kits. Um, so I don't know, like, I, I want to know more from Walmart. I want to know more inside of like, what is their goal? When do they think that this is going to be, uh, you know, not just in the middle of nowhere, Georgia, but kind of rolling out to, um, you know, bigger cities. So what do you think? I like it. And, and for a couple of reasons. So uh, obviously we, you know, as you pointed out, uh, there's, there's been a bunch of tests that they've run, uh, with, with drones for different, uh, categories of product. Last week, of course, we talked about the collaboration between UPS Flight Forward Group and, and uh, Verizon's uh, Skyward on, you know, sort of building up a, a drone delivery capability uh, with the UPS, um, you know, sort of organization, which is, you know, obviously from a scale point of view, very interesting. You know, what, what I like about this story is, I'll take a slightly different angle on it. So, you know, I, I you know, I grew up in, you know, you know, I'm born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s. And so like, you know, those battles between Coke and Pepsi and the, you know, all those commercials and all those like physical events, you know, with the taste tests, you know, the blind taste tests and all that sort of stuff. Like, I remember that stuff and that like, and so I think about fast forward to now and I think about, um, you know, the impact COVID has had on, you know, the ability to go into stores and, you know, in particular, like product sampling, like it's, that's just gone. Like nobody's going to sit there and, you know, give you samples of products to try and touch and taste, <laughs> like, you know, it's just not going to happen anymore. So, you know, having something like the ability to, to like come into a neighborhood and just drop product samples and let people, you know, try them out, you know, via drone, I think is super interesting. It's kind of like a whole new way to kind of do product sampling. Um, and so I like that Walmart and Coke are sort of teaming up on this. Um, and I think the for me, what would be uh, really sort of the piece that's missing here, if I kind of play along with that line of thinking is, you know, what's the feedback cycle, right? Like how do consumers, you know, sort of get back to you and say, yeah, this is amazing. I really like this, or it's disgusting. I hate it. Or, you know, whatever it is, like, where, you know, how do you rate that experience? Um, so, and I know they brought in the sort of the Ibotta mobile rewards piece. So maybe there's a mechanism through that where you can kind of have some sort of feedback cycle, but I think that would be really interesting, but as a way to sort of bring product sampling to the people, as opposed to the people coming in, you know, trying stuff or walking into your Costco and trying stuff or whatever. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, this is super interesting. So, so I quite like that. And I think the, the, I bought a piece of it for me is um, probably a piece that I would like to hear more about. So, um, you know, just what is that integration look like? Is there an opportunity for a feedback cycle? You know, the ability to sort of, um, you know, order a product or order uh, a sample through that or, you know, cash in rewards, you know, which is sort of the, you know, sort of the key uh, component of that in terms of uh, what, what that app does, you know, how those things, you know, tie in. And is there a social component to this as well? Like are people out there alongside this drone delivery thing, you know, out there sort of talking about it on social media, tagging, you know, Coke, uh, you know, and, and Walmart in this campaign, you know, to create content as well. So, but, but I like it. I, I think it's super interesting. I think it's a great way to kind of get you know, product sampling out there. So my only question to you is how, like, how far is Coffee County from Atlanta? Like, is that like 30 minutes, an it's hour? Three, no, it's probably like three hours. It's three honestly hours. like on the, on the way to the shore. So it's, it's, it's quite a ways away. It's past Macon. Um, Cause I had to look it up of course, but yeah, I, you know, I agree on, on the tasting. It's like the, the fun Saturdays of that being like, <laughs> my you know a fun thing to do with my kids like hey we're going to costco and you get to taste all the food and it was like hey it's like free lunch you know we'll grab a slice of pizza on the way out get the shopping done 
um, are over and it's, it's sad, right? But uh, I love the idea of like these, you know, sort of community like taste testing kind of things. Um, but I'm also interested to know, like, is this actually a full on campaign at this point? Or is this just like, hey, we delivered it to 10 people. And you know, like how, how much how much work is it at this point? How automated has it become so that we could know like how much further do we have to go? But I like how you're thinking ahead in terms of like, how do we have that organic, you know, community involvement, that feedback loop, um, that social component, all of that, super important. Yeah, so uh, maybe a family road trip to uh, Coffee County this weekend, Aubriana, for you guys. Yeah, we're gonna go just to see if we can get a drone delivery. <laughs> some, uh, <laughs> and I think the kids would be quite quite so. excited about that, right? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to our second story now. So shifting from uh, Coke to music, um, Gibson's, the iconic uh, guitar uh, company, guitar brand uh, company, has come up with something pretty interesting here. They are tapping into what they're calling audio augmented reality. Um, and so we've talked a lot on the show about, you know, sort of the rise of AR and VR and so on. So Gibson's has launched a, a new app on iOS and Android, and it comes equipped with what they call audio augmented reality. So what it does is it gives real-time feedback to people learning to play a guitar, uh, you know, taking lessons essentially through the app. Uh, so you're getting real-time feedback on, you know, how that's going. So it's audio AR, it's developed by Gibson and a company called Soundio, uh, which is based in Stockholm. And basically, it's it's kind of like two way interaction through an app, um, you know. So I guess like you, I haven't tried it yet. I'm going to try it this weekend. Uh, and my my son, who he he takes drum lessons, and he he was taking guitar lessons, but didn't like the the teacher, so we kind of stopped that. Um, I I think this would be another way to to kind of go about that. So we're I think we'll maybe we'll try it together. We'll see, but. Um, yeah, I think this is super interesting, like to be able to have like an app where you can kind of sort of get that real time feedback, you know, maybe, you, you know, they're like, play this chord, and then they're like, no, try this or move your finger here or what I don't know how it's going to work. But um, I think that's super interesting. So it's like a mobile learning program, step by step, step by step guide guidance on uh, on how to play at any skill level, apparently through different levels in there and different genres uh, as well. Uh, so you can choose, and you can also choose lessons on whether you're like learning to play like lead guitar or a rhythm, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, type of approach. Um, and they've, yeah, they got all sorts of popular songs and, and you know, other things in there and digital tuners and all kinds of things for you to, to uh, fool around with. So I think this is super interesting. I, and I love the idea of using audio um, as a way to engage, but more importantly, to have that sort of two-way interaction and feedback uh, cycle. I think it's it's very unique, very interesting. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I like this um, a lot. So I have a guitar and I have like strummed probably since high school, but I rarely pick it up now. You know, it's more like on, um, you know, random days, my kids want to take it out and, and play uh, that or the trumpet, <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> Um, but for a little bit, I was like, okay, I'm going to try and learn how to play one song, you know, again on the guitar, but you know how it is when you stop playing for a long time and your fingers are like super weak <laughs> yeah. and it takes a while to build up to that. So consistency is the key. Um, but there was another app that I was using. It was called guitar tuna and, you know, you can obviously tune the guitar there, but there were some lessons that, you know, you had to sit through some paid advertising for, but it was great because it sort of had something similar where it would give you feedback and tell you like how well you did and kind of give you a score on how many notes you maybe missed or, um, you know, it, and I like that. I love that it's like just helping, you know, beginners. And especially when you think about, you know, music's such a hard thing because you don't know how long your kids are going to be interested in it. You know, do you invest the time in an instrument and the money it takes to have like a, a private tutor and, you know, get those lessons. And like you said, you know, then they don't like the teacher or, you know, it kind of falls off. And so I like the idea of having these sort of uh, like, you know, a step or, or kind of dipping your toe in the water and being able to do that at a, at a smaller level before there's like a full on commitment, right? Um, for one. And then the other is, yes, the idea of audio augmented reality. When I heard that, it almost sounded like, I don't know, like, 
in my mind, I was thinking it probably is like LSD without taking any drugs, right? Like an audio augmented reality, like where you're just in this. <laughs> I'm thing. hearing voices. <laughs> what it sounds like, but, <laughs> but I love the idea that it's Gibson guitar and, you know, it just sounds like um, a great thing for them to be involved in, obviously. Um, and just the fact that like, how can you reach more people right now? How can you continue to kind of um, cultivate music, love and learning. And uh, I think that it's all, um, it's, it's all that integration is thoughtful and it's great. So yeah. There you go. So check it out. If you're into music, not into music, you know, have kids, you want, want to get them into music, try it out. Uh, let us know what you think. Uh, I'll be trying it out this weekend. So there you go. Yeah, I think we'll probably have to get like a ukulele or something for my kids. The guitar's quite big for them at this point. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so we're going to shift gears here from music to parking. Um, and this is a new partnership that's kicking off between Park Mobile and a company called Tiva uh, for contactless parking payments for parking garages. And this is interesting. So, you know, over the years, we've shared a lot of stories about Park Mobile and their mobile parking payment app. Um, and now, you know, through this this uh, Tiba parking systems uh, partnership, you know, they're they're taking that even a step further. So Tiba Group is based in Tel Aviv and they design, manufacture, distribute, support um, all these different solutions for the management of off street revenue parking. Um, and they were recently acquired by FAAC, which is an Italy based provider of automation and vehicle and, and pedestrian access control. So, uh, you know, this is very, very much a global story here. So this integration is really going to make it easier for consumers to pay um, at gated parking garages, which, you know, when you have bigger cities, there's tons of those, you know, whenever I go to the doctor or you know, wherever, like I have to use a gated parking garage and, and pay for that. But this is going to, you know, help with a few different things. One, it'll minimize the wear and tear on, on that physical parking equipment, the gates and all of those things, but also limiting the spread of germs, you know, touching a, a screen and, you know, inserting your credit card and tickets and touching buttons that probably doesn't get uh, clean very often is, is kind of, um, you know, not something that people want to be doing a lot right now, especially. And basically what's going to happen is that people, whenever you park, whenever you park in a parking garage that, that the TBA solutions are integrated and you can just pull a ticket from the entry, scan it with your park mobile app um, and just pay right there. And the, the gate's just going to lift. So it's pretty, you know, seamless. And I like this a lot. Park Mobile has over 20 million users and they'll be able to use the app to pay for over 1.9 million parking spaces around the country through Tiba. That's not 1.9 million parking garages, but parking spaces uh, around, around the country. So, you know, I think this is great. Like using Park Mobile to park on the street is, you know, convenient and it's nice, but to be able to use this even further, uh, I think is, is great. So you still have to pull the ticket, but obviously you don't have to touch any of the buttons on the way out, which is kind of nice. So I like this. I think it's thoughtful. Uh, I think it's taking the, the usefulness of, of a already well-used app um, even further. And um, I think it makes sense. So yeah, uh, I like this story too. I don't have a ton more to add to what you've already said, but I mean, these guys, so, uh, you know, we've covered Park Mobile over the years, uh, you know, solid company, a Dutch-based company, been around for a while. And, and I think this idea of, um, you know, enabling sort of a contact-free type of uh, parking payment experience, I think makes sense. I mean, every business that we, in every industry, whether it's parking, restaurants, you know, take out retail, whatever, everybody's trying to find their way into, you know, as little contact as possible. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, whether, you know, these guys can do that in parking because they have the user base uh, with the app and, and the platform and can tie that into, uh, into the parking garages, you know, that makes sense. I was looking at, uh, at their site um, the other day and um, they've got a pretty nice white paper. So if you just go to Park Mobile's uh, website, you'll see they've, they've got a white paper on sort of uh, coronavirus and, um, you know, how long it sort of typically stays on equipment like parking machines and things like that. Um, they say it can stay up, up to a month. Um, it can kind of sort of stay resident there. So that's kind of interesting. So go check out that white paper as a little aside. Um, but yeah, I, I think sort of enabling the sort of uh, 
touch-free type of engagement and payment um, it is really important. And, and, you know, up here in Canada, we've been very fortunate that, you know, we've had tap and pay forever, um, you know, in our retail experiences. So at the gas station, at, you know, most retail stores, you know, we've, we've had that sort of, you know, tap and pay with our cards for a long, long time up here. Um, I know the U.S. is, is uh, didn't support that for the longest time. So uh, I know you're there now or getting there now. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's really important. So, you know, whether that's with a card or with your phone uh, that you're tapping, you know, you got to do that. Keep in mind, though, like we still need to be wiping down those things, too. Right. Like and, uh, you know, keeping those things sanitized. But, uh, yeah, I, I think this is a great initiative. Check out the white paper on the Park Mobile site and, you um, yeah, let's hope more parking garages uh, implement technologies like this. When we do actually go back out yeah. to where we have to park. So <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, yeah, yeah, final story now. Um, so this is uh, fairly uh, breaking news here this week. Uh, our friends at Place IQ have acquired the geospatial insights business of another LBMA member company, uh, Skyhook. Uh, Skyhook Wireless, that is. And so, uh, you know, this is a very, uh, I think it's an interesting story. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of shakeup overall in the sort of location-based advertising and media and data uh, business over the last couple of years. Uh, Place IQ has made a number of acquisitions, Foursquare has made a number of acquisitions, and so on. Um, but really, I, I think at the end of the day, what's happening overall is you're starting to see this sort of separation, right, of companies that are falling into the sort of media activation side of location data, uh, other companies that are staying on sort of the pure sort of data aggregation and data um, collection side of things, and then others that sort of try to bridge the gap between the two that are really around sort of making some sort of sense uh, or deriving insights from that data. Um, and so, it, you know, it's interesting because, you know, Place IQ's sort of put, put their uh, mark on sort of being on that sort of insights piece. Um, and Duncan and company, you know, they've been at this for a long time over there. And so, yeah, so they're acquiring the geospatial insights business uh, from Skyhook. Um, and it also gives them access to Skyhook's uh, data enrichment SDK, which allows, you know, for sort of that collecting collection of first party data, um, you know, from certain apps and, and platforms out there. Um, so that, you know, um, I don't have a lot more to say about it than that. I think what's interesting, though, is that Skyhook is retaining its focus. Uh, so they're not like completely selling the company. They're just selling that aspect of their business and then continuing to focus and invest further in what they call their precise location solution. So that is their, uh, you know, their orientation. Uh, Skyhook's kind of focus on really gathering as much data as possible from as many sources as possible. And so, you know, the play here is, is that as SDK data becomes less and less available, uh, you know, because of changes in iOS 14 and the IDFA and Google Ad ID and all those things that we've talked about, I think that, you know, one of the ways to mitigate that is to go out and find other data sources. And, and by that, I mean, you know, connected devices everywhere, right? So whether that's, you know, thermostats or, you know, printers or computers or whatever else is out there that's internet enabled and connected to a network, it has an ID. And if we can kind of determine, you know, location from that, I think that becomes interesting. You know, we've seen really solid applications of that data in things like E911, um, you know, with the National Emergency uh, Response Database and things like that, um, you know, by having, you know, precise indoor positioning coming off of those types of devices. Um, and I think more and more we need to uh, gather other data sources. So I, I think sort of Skyhook saying, look, you know, we're going to focus on precise location and we're going to let guys like Place IQ you know, take and focus on that insights and, and sort of activation, um, you know, and, and sort of uh, marketing analytics pieces of, of the industry. What's your take on this? Yeah, so, um, you know, I reached out to my friends over at Skyhook to see how things were going um, and nothing that I can really share or <laughs> add there so much as, you know, I think that right now, 
all of this location data and these changes is still, you know, it, it is a little bit of the wild, wild west again. Nobody really knows exactly what the rules are today or what they're going to be tomorrow um, or how that's going to impact all of these players. So, you know, it's going to be an interesting next, you know, probably two years uh, as we think about what legislation changes are, are coming down, um, you know, what technology changes are, are affecting this. Um, and, and how does that work with location data, not only for marketing, but as you mentioned, for, for other uh, purposes like navigation or, you know, uh, emergency services. So there's a lot of things to con consider and um, it's going to be interesting just to keep watching this, this play out, you know, it's like a really long chess game at this point. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, you know, like we're, we're just early in this year, right? I think there's going to be a lot of fallout, you know, uh, over the next few months, um, just like there was with GDPR. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of shifting in the sand here of uh, movements by companies in, in our space. So it'll be interesting to watch and, and interesting to report on and talk about. Yep. We'll be following it here for sure. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. That's our four stories for this week, a wide array of things uh, that we've covered off there. We thank you for your time, for listening and watching and supporting. Uh, reach out to us if you have story ideas, uh, you know, give us some, uh, some love on social media, uh, whichever channel we're on all of them. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be back next week with episode 503. Have a great week, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.